All right, how's it going, y'all? So this video is kind of going to serve as a bit of a retraction, and I guess it's not fully a retraction because things changed. But for the longest time, I was not recommending a read-write cache, or for the most part, for most users, a read cache, just because it was not that great for Synology NAS. But since the invention of this thing right here, that has completely changed. And the integration with DSM-7 has made it even further, where now, I honestly think pretty much all users will see a benefit from having a read-write cache in their Synology NAS as long as they're using M.2 NVMe SSDs for that cache. All right, so first off, I wanna talk about a few things. First off, how, what is a read cache? What is a read-write cache? And also, how does an M.2 NVMe SSD differ from your regular SATA SSD that's two and a half inches that would go into a bay like this? And in reality, they are completely different and have a huge performance increase. All right, so first off, I wanna talk about what is a read SSD cache in regard to a Synology NAS. A read SSD cache is pretty simple. Every time data is accessed, it's first loaded into RAM from the disks and then given to the user. So when you've got a read SSD cache and you request a file or a part of a file, what happens is first the Synology looks, hey, is this in RAM? Next it goes, hey, is this in a SSD cache? And finally, if it's not, it'll go ahead and look at the disk and pull it off the disk. And so the way stuff gets loaded in the read cache is pretty simple. Every time that something gets loaded in from the disk into RAM, that is a random read depending on how you've got it set, it then gets loaded into the SSD cache once it's removed from RAM. And so that way, the next time that that file is requested, instead of having to go to the really slow mechanical hard drives, it is able to pull it directly from an ultra fast SSD. And so in the past, these were two and a half inch SSDs using the SATA bus. And that's important, and I'll get to that in a minute why. And so then it uses what's called the least recently used algorithm. So the thing that was least recently used, once the cache gets full, gets booted out. And so that way you have the most recently used data in the SSD cache where you're most likely to pull from it. The issue with that is a backup. A backup goes through your entire disk normally, meaning that the least recently used gets completely thrown out because it's basically the last set of data that you've actually got in that backup. So it kind of invalidates the cache. And so the cache has to get hot again. And so it's got to warm up and it's got to get the actual important stuff loaded in there over time. Now read caches are completely fine. They will never cause you issues because all the data is really still kept on the actual hard drives. It's just also kept in another location. So while your NAS is running, you can rip out a read cache. You probably shouldn't eject it still but you can rip out a read cache and all of your data will still be there because all copies of data that are on the read cache are also already committed to the disks. Now that's where a read write cache comes in. So a read write cache not only caches reads like the previous one, but it also goes through and caches writes. So that means if your disks are really busy, instead of having to wait until the data can be written to the actual hard drives themselves before saying, yes, yeah, send over the next data to your computer, Instead it goes, okay, the disks are really busy. I'm not going to send it into the disks. Instead, I'm going to send it into the NVMe or the SATA SSD and store it there. And so then once everything kind of calms down, then it'll say, okay, whew. all right, so the disks are finally slowing down a little bit. We can go through and start dumping the stuff that was written to the SSD back to the main pool. And so that way you can kind of get the best of both worlds. For periods of time, your NAS acts just like a SSD. It is insanely fast, but with the storage of hard drives. And so that can be great. The thing is, with a read-write cache, that data is not written to disk before the acknowledgement is sent. And so recently used data, recently modified files, might not be committed to disk. And so if that SSD were to fail, you could actually have data loss because you don't have it committed to disks yet. And so that's why all read-write caches on a Synology NAS are required to be RAID 1 or better. So that means that at least one disk can fail, and since it's mirrored, it will automatically be on the other one, and so you won't actually lose any data in that case. And with Synology DSM-7, it's actually really smart. As soon as one drive fails or becomes critical or anything like that, the read cache basically turns off and it says, okay, I don't know what's gonna happen in the next few minutes, but we might lose data. So instead, I'm just gonna flush all that stuff to disks all the stuff that's only in the read cache is immediately put back in disk as soon as possible. So in the case where you're unprotected, you get protected as quickly as possible, which is a great setting to have. 
Now also with DSM-7, you have another option to do what's called pin BTRFS metadata to the SSD cache. And that's only for people who have the read cache enabled. And BTRFS metadata can be huge. It can pretty easily be a couple hundred gigabytes. So you need to have a big SSD cache, but for certain workflows, it can be huge. So workflows that are often having to go through and change the BTRFS metadata and things like that will really benefit from pinning it to the SSD cache. Specifically things like time machine backups, things like active backup for business, things that are going through and modifying a ton of small files, virtual machines are another one, those would really benefit from pinning the BTRFS metadata to your SSD cache. You just need really big cache drives. And so that's another cool feature in DSM-7 that I really don't know how to benchmark and I'm working on figuring that out. But once I'm able to, I'll definitely do some videos in it and see what the performance increase is for specific use cases. I've done it for a few clients and overall their workflows have significantly increased for a lot of different cases. So if you don't need a huge SSD cache and you've got like one terabyte SSDs in there, it's probably a good idea to pin it if you can, if you're already using a read-write cache. Now onto these guys right here. So this one happens to be a Seagate Ironwolf NVMe SSD. They did send this to me for free a while back and I've actually not been able to review it yet because I've been busy with the Synology one. I've kind of been behind on that. But overall, I really have liked it so far. I've got one of these running in my other servers and it's honestly really fast. And it really shows the huge difference between something like this and a SATA SSD. So SATA as a standard was written with the assumption that whatever storage backend was connected was gonna be very slow and have really high latency. Because when they developed a SATA standard, they only had hard drives. So the entire protocol was really written assuming that, oh yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit slow because it'll be more stable. And that way we can send data there. And if it takes a little bit to come back, it's not that big of a deal because compared to the speed of a hard drive, it's gonna be really fast. So the SATA bus is limited to six gigabit per second, which is about 500 megabytes per second read and write. And it is one directional. That's another big one. The thing is, this right here is an NVMe SSD in the M.2 form factor. NVMe means that we are not using the SATA standard anymore. Instead, we're using PCIe and a direct communication that is optimized for insanely fast SSDs. So while a standard SATA SSD will have a lot better IOPS than a regular hard drive, it's still not gonna be that fast compared to a bunch of spinning disks because it is limited to a single SATA bus. And because of that overhead of SATA, it's also just gonna be slower than what the SSD inside could do. With NVMe on the other hand, you get insanely fast performance because you are no longer limited by using the SATA protocol or the bus speed of it. Instead, NVMe generally uses a PCIe slot to be insanely fast. They also have so many more IOPS, that's operations per second, than a regular SATA SSD ever could because that slowed down with the SATA protocol. And so a NVMe SSD has completely changed the game when it comes to actually setting up a SSD cache. Because for the longest time, I did not recommend people use SSD caching because it were those slow SATA SSDs. And so you would get issues where, honestly, the SSD cache could be slowing you down overall. But with NVMe, all that's completely changed. And now I've honestly started recommending to people, yeah, if you want better performance, go ahead and use an M.2 NVMe SSD for your caching in read-write. So these NVMe SSDs are so fast that as read-write caches, they are incredibly effective. They allow you to keep going at incredibly fast speeds, even while a bunch of stuff's going on with the operating system. On Synology that just have mechanical hard drives, you'll notice sometimes that DSM becomes kind of unresponsive, especially while transfers are going through and things like that. When you have an SSD cache, especially a read-write one, that's completely no longer the case. They are so much faster, and it's amazing how much more responsive everything is. Because when the disk starts to slow down, that's when that SSD really kicks in and just is lightning fast. This tutorial is not going to necessarily cover the full installation. I want to set a dedicated video to that that goes over exactly setting up a read-write cache and what I recommend. But really quickly, what I've actually started doing with all my SSD caches, especially the read-write ones, is I actually under-allocate them. So say this is a 480 gig NVMe SSD. I'll actually only allocate it maybe 350 gigs 
That's because there is a point of diminishing return. The more SSD space you have, the less it helps you overall. Having more will still help you, but not by that much. And it also has to use RAM. Every single gig of SSD cache actually has to be indexed. And so I think it takes about 400 kilobytes. So the more SSD cache you have, the more RAM you have to use, which slows down your system slightly. The thing is pretty much all consumer SSDs are not designed to be at 100% storage and still be really fast. They're designed to have these little small sections of the drive that are pretty much their own micro SSD caches within the larger SSD cache. And so by overfilling them, you do get a lot worse performance. And so what I've started doing is I'll allocate them a lot less. And so that way you never fill it up. And so you've always got that super fast place to write really fast to, while honestly not affecting your usability that much because cutting your SSD cache in half is not going to give you half the SSD performance. It's probably going to still net you if I had to ballpark and every single workflow is gonna be different. I ballpark around cutting it in half might give you 80% the same rather than the 50% the same. And so in my experience, cutting it by about maybe 70% the total size of the SSD is a lot better than giving it the full thing from a performance perspective. That does change if you've got a smaller SSD cache and you're pinning the BTRFS metadata, but overall it should really help you out. But these things are just so fast compared to the SATA SSDs that it means you really don't run into bottlenecks because of the SSD cache. I have yet to find a workflow that is slowed down because of including SSD caching in there, and that is huge, especially since the new DSM update came out. So at this point, I'm more than comfortable recommending people install NVMe SSD caches. Read write can be great for a lot of users, but if you want the utmost data security, a read only cache is still going to be better because that means that both drives can fail and you won't lose any data. All right, well, that's going to be it for this overview. Go and leave any other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below, and have a good one. Bye.